Viewer discretion is advised. Police discovered 053 in the deceased bodies of the couple within the same room. Madeline had died from multiple stab wounds inflicted by Andrew, who had died from a massive heart attack. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Euclid Class Object SCP-053. SCP-053, also known as the young girl, is a small three-year-old girl. She is capable of basic speech and appears to be slightly above average in terms of mental development. Her personality is generally pleasant and she rarely seems to get upset. However, she will appear agitated when in a large group. Any and all humans over the age of three who engage in eye contact and physical touch or those who remain around 053 for longer than 10 minutes rapidly become irrational, paranoid, and homicidal. Most, if not all, of these feelings will be directed at 053, and afflicted subjects will attempt to kill 053 after first killing or driving off all humans visible to them. Those attempting to kill 053 will suffer massive heart attacks or seizures and die seconds after inflicting physical damage to 053. However, 053 has a healing factor that allows her to regenerate almost instantaneously from any wound. According to a recovery log, SCP-053 was discovered on July 10, 2008 in Pennsylvania at the residence of Andrew and Madeline. Police who attempted to interact with 053 also suffered from 053's anomalous effects, resulting in five additional casualties before implanted Foundation agents assessed the situation and properly secured the subject. Class A amnestic drugs were administered to all non-personnel involved, including Andrew's parents in Florida, as they had been exposed to information regarding SCP-053 through communication with Andrew. Since June 5, 2004, Andrew had been sending his mother news and updates on SCP-053. They named her as Abby. Below is the documentation log from four years ago, first email about Abby, to July 10, 2008, the last email sent out by Andrew to his mother. June 5, 2004. Hey mom, sorry I haven't emailed you throughout the past month. Things have been pretty busy, but I have great news. You're gonna be a grandma. We found out yesterday that Maddie's pregnant and we've already started turning the guest room into a baby room. Good thing I got a pay raise last week. We gotta think of the baby now. Hope to hear from you soon. March 7th, 2005. It's a girl. She was born last night around 10 at night. Madeline's water broke as she was going to sleep. We drove to the hospital so fast, I think I almost hit someone. Jesus, waiting for the doctors to deliver her felt like years. Now, as I type this email, she's downstairs, fast asleep in Maddie's arms. We named her Abby, and she's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I'll send pictures soon. March 8, 2006 Hey mom, Abby's first birthday was yesterday. Howard and Rachel even showed up. Got to see their niece for the first time. Too bad you and dad are all the way down in Florida. We'll have to visit when Abby's older. Love you. June 24, 2008. There's been an accident. We were at the playground and we took our eyes off of her for one second and she fell off of the jungle gym and landed on her head. I saw blood. The doctor said she'll recover fine, but I can't sleep. It is all my fault. June 25, 2008. The hospital called and said that Abby will have to stay there for a few more days, but she's all patched up and on the fast track to recovery. No brain damage or anything, it seems. I'm just glad my baby is gonna be okay. July 2nd, 2008. Mom, there's something wrong with Abby. I mean, she looks and acts perfectly fine, but I know something isn't right with her. Madeline says she feels it too. We started feeling it after Abby's injury at the playground. We've had the doctors look her over, but as far as they're concerned, they couldn't identify any permanent damage, physical or mental. But I just know there's something wrong with her. July 5th, 2008. We got an email from Dr. Williams today. He says that he's been able to identify problems exist in Abby, but he can't determine if they're physical or mental. It just doesn't make any sense, he says. He claimed that whenever he was around her, he couldn't shake the feeling of wrongness. The staff who were working with him agreed, apparently. He didn't tell us at first because he didn't want Maddie and I to worry. 
but it appears that he just couldn't keep quiet any longer. What's wrong with my daughter? July 9, 2008 I can't even look at Abby for more than a few seconds at a time now. There's something about her now and it just shouldn't be. When I'm around her, I just get this awful, indescribable feeling. Like I'd rather be anywhere else but next to my own daughter. I try and limit my interaction with her as much as I possibly can. It's terrible. But being around her, it makes me want to throw up. It's inside of her, in her eyes, in her skin, everything about her. I just don't know what it is. July 10th, 2008. I touched her hand. It felt so wrong. Madeline said she felt it too, but she believes that it's something inside of her. I'm going to kill them both. I'm going to kill that and I'm going to kill that thing. It needs to die. After receiving the last email, Andrew's mother quickly phoned the local police to check on his son. Soon after, police discovered 053 and the deceased bodies of the couple within the same room. Madeline had died from multiple stab wounds inflicted by Andrew, who had died from a massive heart attack shortly afterward, believed to have been caused by 053's anomalous effects. Following this incident, 053 was contained by the foundation. 053 is to be contained in an area no less than 5 by 5 meters and given adequate room to move. Toys, books, games, and other recreational devices are to be provided and rotated every three months. Proper bedding, bathroom, and medical facilities are to be maintained at all times. In addition, 053 is also given three meals a day, alongside snacks if requested. Anyone who enters her chamber must wear an eye-covering suit for safety concerns and while gifts from her are allowed to be accepted, they must be removed from the room. Only one person is allowed in her room in any given instance, and they are only permitted to stay for no longer than 10 minutes. Any sharp objects or firearms are banned from her room, and anyone who begins to act erratically, scream, or attempt to grab 053 are to be removed and quarantined. In a termination test, the foundation introduced SCP-682 to SCP-053. 682 appeared to be very confused and showed no signs of being affected by 053. Initially, 053 appeared to be afraid of 682 and hid behind a chair in her containment area. 682 then lowered itself to the ground, resting its head on the floor and spoke after a while. 053 approached 682 and after several seconds of hesitation, she briefly touched SCP-682 before quickly returning to her hiding place. 682 had no reaction. 053 approached 682 and pat its head, causing it to exhale through its forward nostrils. SCP-053 clapped and hopped in place several times before embracing the head of SCP-682. For the remainder of the testing period, 682 did not feel frustrated by spending time with this small child like he did in every other test. He understood that the child was a hated thing as well, one that had suffered like him. They were alike in that way. He had attempted to break out a few times anyways to find out where the disgusting researchers were watching from and find out if they had hurt her as they had him. This had, however, frightened 053. So, for the time being, he allowed himself to be decorated with a cowboy hat that was too small. Although he appreciated how oddly pleasant and relaxing it was when her tiny arms hugged his scarred, scaly back and demanded to be carried around. Eventually, 053 grew tired, yawning and rubbing her eyes with tiny fists. 682 lifted the child carefully in his teeth by the back of her shirt and carried her off to bed, placing her gently on the mattress and circling the bed once twice, three times, before curling around her in a protective little ring. Soon enough, 053 was fast asleep, and he was her new protector. The alarms went off, and Builder Bear was spotted with its creations rampaging through Site-24. Quick, we need to contain it right away. We can't let it disappear again. Wait, where are you going? A bear with colorful patches slipped through Dr. Manson's legs. It ran across the hallway as fast as its stubby legs could, making a beeline towards the injured personnel. It took one look at the man's missing limb and immediately fashioned one up with its own material. You're just that selfless, aren't you? Men, I need cover for Kairos over there. 
I'll go bring any cloth I can find for him to do his work. When Dr. Manson returned with the necessary materials, the bear was nowhere to be seen among the chaos. Following the trail of patched up personnel, he found the bear silently hugging a young boy in a D-class uniform. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Safe Class Object SCP-2295. SCP-2295, also known as the bear with a heart of patchwork, is a patchwork stuffed bear. It is approximately 18 inches from head to foot and is stuffed with synthetic fiber and cotton. 2295 has a small, anatomically correct pin of a heart on the left side of its thorax and a bow wrapped around its neck. The fabric and color of 2295's patches vary. Tests confirm that no components of 2295 contain any anomalous chemical properties. 2295 goes active when within 7 feet of a human sustaining major trauma to an organ. It will anomalously produce scissors, white thread, and either sewing needles or a crocheting hook from its mouth. Then use any fabric and stuffing within reach to fashion an instance of SCP-2295-1, a patchwork imitation of the subject's organ. 2295-1 vanishes from sight while the subject falls unconscious. It will then replace the subject's damaged organ via anomalous means. The whereabouts of the replaced organs are undetermined. If there is no usable material in close proximity, 2295 will use fabric and stuffing from itself. 2295 regenerates one gram of stuffing every day until completely replacing any lost or used stuffing. Note that fabric used this way does not regenerate, and additional fabric must be placed near 2295 for the purpose of self-mending. There have been no cases of rejected 2295-1 instances and all subjects recorded at the time of writing made full recoveries. Originally, 2295 was just a sentient, plain brown bear doll under the care of a boy named Michael. One day, 2295 found itself lying on wet grass in the yard. The house was on fire. It found an open window and plopped right in. The bear soldiered through the inferno and found Michael lying at the bottom of the stairs, barely moving. The boy was coated head to toe in burns. His hair had been singed off, and what was left of his clothes had fused to his flesh in places. 2295 frantically looked about, searching for something, anything it could use to repair him, but everything was in flames. There was no way to help the boy here. They had to get out. It tried to drag Michael to safety, but it couldn't even lift his arm. As the floor quaked and the ceiling gave, 2295 could do nothing but cry and hug the boy. Together, they plummeted into the earth. The next day, the firefighters couldn't find the boy among the rubble. Sorry, ma'am. We couldn't find your son. Only this. A firefighter handed the woman a damaged teddy bear. As she wept and hugged it, she could feel it hugging her back. Time passed, and 2295 regained consciousness once again, finding itself in front of its own reflection. Patches of colorful cloth had replaced its drab brown body, and a pretty bow to tie the look together. A gentle hand picked it up. It was a man the bear had never seen before. Hope you don't mind my shoddy work. And looky here. He lifted up a card that said, Hello, my name is Kairos. The bear tilted its head and looked at the man in confusion. It's ancient Greek. It means an opportune moment. Figured it suits you. Now you're going to find that perfect opportune moment to swoop in and be there for others where no one else can. The bear nodded gleefully. The man then nestled it affectionately into a box alongside the note. He waved goodbye to the bear and reached down for the lid. 2295 was recovered at the side of a crashed delivery mail van. When authorities arrived, it was found out of the box, sitting next to the injured but patched up driver. Ever since its arrival at the foundation, 2295 has helped many people. You look wonderful. Are these the works of the bear? Yeah, aren't they amazing? It's like getting a tattoo but without the needle stabbing part, just burns. Damn, now my face feels a little bland compared to my body. Wouldn't mind getting burned a little more to get more color on my face. <laughs> my heart used to beat like crazy every time I moved a little, thought I was about to die. But then I was offered a chance to undergo an operation by the stuffed teddy bear. Now here I am feeling better than ever. From the corner of the rim, the bear caught the attention of the D-class while peeking over the tall crates. It hopped over and they greeted 2295, then embraced one another. Hey bear, I heard that evil twin brother bear of yours went on a rampage, hurt a lot of people. I'm sure you saved everyone's lives there too, right? 
Upon hearing that, 2295 appeared saddened and began retreating back to the corner. However, it was intercepted by Dr. Manson. He picked the teddy bear up gently and stroked its head, then rested it on the table. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, fellas, but a young man, one of the D-Class subjects, didn't make it. The D-Classes were in shock. They looked over to the bear in disbelief as it lowered its head and hid itself behind Dr. Manson. How can that be? Ain't that bear right there a magic surgeon or something? Yes, Kairos here is capable of fantastic feats of surgery. There's no doubt about that. Even so, there's a limit to its abilities. You see, he can only replace things that are broken, but not fixing them. The boy suffered severe cerebral hemorrhage during the time when SCP-1048 made its appearance. One of its creations, 1048-C, damn near maimed the poor boy. Kairos tried his hardest to gather what available materials within proximity to initiate repairs. But the young man's life was rapidly fading at the time, so perhaps Kairos didn't have enough time to fashion the necessary parts to replace the faulty ones. Or perhaps it was more complicated than just simply replacing parts. Too many factors at play, Dr. Manson said as he stroked the depressed teddy bear's head. So, could Kairos do anything for the lad before he passed? Kairos conjured a sweet, Dove's king-size chocolate candy bar and gave it to the young man. It was his favorite. He was fading in and out of consciousness then, but luckily, he was aware of Kairos's kindness. Thank you, he said weakly as he grasped the candy bar. Kairos spent the rest of his time embracing him while his eyes produced a saline solution. So, what? He was curing him with a solution or something? He was crying, genius. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Kairos, don't be sad. You've done so much for us. Look around, we're standing here alive and kicking all because of you. Upon hearing the D-Class's kind words, 2295 looked up at them with its beady eyes. Yeah, look at me. I've also got these awesome colored patches all over my body. It's better than any tattoo I could ever ask for. D-3452 patted on its head and wiped the liquid around its eyes. As soon as D-3452 retracted his hand, 2295's eyes got soaked again immediately. It reached out both its stubby hands towards the humans. Oh, come here, you little fuzzball. You've done a lot of good, Kairos. More than enough. Be proud of that. I know I am. Together, the men and the teddy bear embraced each other in silence. Saline solution rolled down its cheeks once more. My research had led me to a small island off the coast of northern Japan. It was speculated that there was some hidden temple in the area full of artifacts, buried by time and waiting to be dug up. But on one cold winter day while milling about the dig site, I saw something that didn't match the browns, greens, and grays of nature that surrounded the area. Instead, my eyes were transfixed on a large patch of golden brown. Curious and confused by this, I left my crew behind and wandered through some trees before I found myself standing in front of it. I slowly crouched down and ran my hands through it and was stunned to feel that it felt like fur. Deeply puzzled, I took out my pocket knife and took a small sample to analyze without telling any of my peers. After a few hours of testing, the results indicated that what I had found was indeed fur. Fur that belonged to a corgi, as a matter of fact. Baffled by this, I quickly gathered up the other archaeologists and researchers and showed them my discovery. We all were stumped as to how it was possible for the fur to be so well preserved, but excited nonetheless. We quickly posted our findings online and turned our attention back to digging up the area. Pretty soon, we discovered that this mass of fur kept going and going no matter how far we excavated the area. Around a week later, we were met by Japanese officials and some odd man who went by Agent S. He instructed us that we were to close up immediately and that our dig was to be taken over by the Japanese government. Oh well, I hope whoever they are, they have the means to take good care of this furry creature. Have a feeling that it means us no harm. Could be an actual corgi, I wonder. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Safe Class Object SCP-2952. SCP-2952, also known as C-O-R-G-I is classified as safe and is most likely one of the most bizarre and adorable anomalous entities that the Foundation has come across. Many Foundation researchers are proud to report that 2952 is an anomalous Pembroke Welsh Corgi. What makes this Corgi unique 
is the fact that it is just shy of over 30,000 kilometers in length. Its little head and front paws are located near three Portlands, while its hindquarters are in rural Japan. The rest of its body weaves across the Americas, Europe, and Asia. Furthermore, 2952 is thought to have the ability to infinitely regenerate through unknown means. Should any part of its body be damaged, it will repair itself very quickly. Samples of tissue taken have proven to be capable of rebuilding themselves regardless of what damage it sustains. As to how this is possible, no one knows. Oddly enough, 2952 does not require sustenance of any kind and refuses to move more than a few feet away from its original position. Something that has been speculated is that 2952 is able to change the shape of its body, making it thinner or larger in places. This is thought to help keep its body out of sight by the general public and dangerous animals, or as a way to blend in with the environment. This has only been seen once in an incident involving archaeologists in rural Japan, who have since had their memories of 2952 removed. Other than the incredible length of 2952, its body seems to operate as a unique and anomalous transportation system. Travel is done through tiny openings a few centimeters wide and tall on its body that open on a schedule. These entrances have been designated as SCP-2952-1. Humanoid beings around 3 centimeters in height can be seen entering and exiting such openings. Such entities are not visible to the naked eye unless captured on film or through photographs. None are outwardly hostile unless provoked and have been designated as SCP-2952-2. Many of them share physical characteristics of fairies and forest nymphs, but on a much smaller scale. An experiment was undertaken by project director Stevens who ordered several Foundation personnel to block and bury portions of 2952. This was done in order to prevent the general public from stumbling across its body. A few days after this was complete, director Stevens went missing. In his place was a mole that was dressed up to look like director Stevens. Dr. Mills, who was working alongside the crew and was tasked with collecting tissue samples, woke up one morning with poisonous berries in his mouth and sharpened stakes driven through his feet and hands. Believing these two events to be directly related to 2952, the Foundation researched all myths related to fairies and similar entities. After collecting a plethora of information, they found all the possible ways to appease such creatures and performed all the rituals necessary. As soon as a number of rituals were completed, Director Stevens switched places with the mole. He has stated he has no recollection of what happened while he was gone. As for Dr. Mills, he was no longer harassed by instances of 2952-2. However, the wounds he sustained have not healed. Modern medicine nor anomalous means have proven successful in closing his wounds. The instances of 2952-2 sent a letter to Foundation personnel stating they were content with the appeasement but to never block the gates again. The Foundation has since dedicated a task force to ensure that no gates are ever blocked by any means. As a reward, members of the Foundation have been granted the privilege of being capable of seeing instances of 2952-2 with the naked eye. Agent Davies was sent to explore the transportation system located within 2952. She touched 2952's warm, furry body and shrunk down to a size no more than an inch. Then she was granted entrance. Inside were around a dozen or so instances of 2952-2, sitting down on wooden benches covered in petals. Now departing from three Portlands. Next stop, West Coast Rainforest. Agent Davies looked around the interior. It looked just like the usual L trains, but more in tune with nature. Everything was made of wood, leaves, grass, moss, mushrooms, and the like. The walls, ceiling, and floor appeared to be constructed of birch bark wrapped around thin twigs. The walls were lined with seats, which are cushioned with a variety of flower petals. A welcoming sight, considering her expectation of the dog's interior to be more fleshy. Also a good escape from the Foundation's dour and hard floors. As she sat down, Agent Davies heard a voice from her earpiece. Agent, you are free to engage in conversation if needed. Well, all right then. Tech seems to be unaffected by the changes in environment. Good to know. Time to get in touch with nature. 
Agent Davies noticed that the 2952-2 entities resembled humans, but were of earthly skin tones. Some had wings, others had vegetation growing out of their bodies. Most of them were rather jovial and acted just like humans. Agent Davies casually sat beside one of them. Hey, uh, how's it going? Beautiful day, huh? Well, you know, I just hope this thing isn't late again. I tried to make it to the glades in time to harvest some seeds the other day. Everything was gone by the time I arrived. But, you know, that's how it is sometimes. Do you know why it's been late? Some kind of internal blockage. Poor thing's got injuries somewhere down in the tail section, I hear. Aw, oh, poor thing. Another passenger from the front turned towards them and joined their conversation. Somebody tried to hijack this train, you see. Wait, a hijacker? So was it like a human or... He was one of us, I think. I don't know. He was dressed in all black and had a mask on. Pretty bold, too. Hijacking the train with just himself. Can you tell me what happened? Well, it was just a usual Tuesday. I was taking the train as usual from my place to where I harvest my mushrooms. I was sitting in the tail section. That's where I usually sit. It was pretty mundane. But damn, do I regret what I was thinking that day. Man, I hope something exciting would happen to me. This is so boring. Huh, what the hell was that? Suddenly, something loud came from behind where I was sitting. A man dressed in all black pulled out his revolver and fired a single shot in the air. I mean upwards. It hit the roof and the train shook a little. All right, nobody moves. If it ain't clear enough, this is a hijacking situation. I have a gun and a bomb hidden somewhere in this car. If I press this button right here, train goes boom. So no sudden movement. Don't try to be a hero. The passenger under his boot asked him in a shaky voice. Oh, what do you want, man? What do I want? It's very simple. I want you to shut the hell up and stay down. The hijacker seemed to know the train pretty well, including the conductor too. He then spoke into one of the surveillance cameras that was hidden really well, or at least that's what I think he was doing. If you don't want the train or your good boy to blow up right now, be here immediately. That entire car waited for an uncomfortable 10 minutes or so, but no one replied from the intercom or showed up. Everyone was on edge. The hijacker was getting impatient too. Why don't you tell us what you want and we work it out? I don't know what came over me that made me start negotiating with him. Not gonna lie, my heart dropped and I was about to wet my pants when he suddenly glared and pointed his gun at me. Ooh, someone's trying to play hero, huh? All right, I'll entertain you. What I want is very simple. I want this train to stop its operation. No more joy rides across the world. That, that, that's it? Yep, plain and simple. I hate dog trains. Suddenly, he was overcome with rage and fired more shots into the roof. Poor thing must have felt them. Each time he fired, the train shook more violently. I couldn't take it anymore, and I was not the only one who thought the same during that moment. You are a despicable, hateful, and joyless being. I tried to reason with you, but that was simply unreasonable. How can you not like Corgi? Yeah, how can you say such things about something this, this cute? At that point, everyone seemed like they were ready to jump on him, even when the hijacker was waving his gun around. Hey, hey! Stop moving, you all. You don't want to get shot now, do you? I still have the bomb. Ugh. The train suddenly swerved hard. It made everyone lose balance for a second. Corgi must have known what was going on and tried to help us. Most of us seized the opportunity to rush towards the hijacker to bring him down. I got a hold of his gun arm and he fired more shots recklessly, but eventually I got control of the gun and pointed it back at him. Stop, I still have my detonator. If I press this button, Somehow, he still had his detonator in his hand. Oh yeah? But can you react faster than this gun here? Right now, I have it right up against your head. Then you gotta ask yourself one question. Did you fire six shots or only five? I'm sure in all this commotion, you've lost track of it yourself. But being at the other end of the barrel, one squeeze from my finger can blow your head clean off. So ask yourself another question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? He was shaking then and slowly let go of his detonator, and the day was saved. Did you really say that? I swear I heard that speech somewhere. Well, I guess you'll have to take my word for it then, and I'm afraid I'll have to leave you now. This is my station. As the passenger got up, Agent Davies stopped him. Wait, before you leave, tell me, was it five shots or six? 
I got to know. The passenger only chuckled and left the train. At the end of her trip, she ended up in the West Coast rainforest where Foundation personnel were waiting to pick her up. So, how was your little trip? A good bit of fun. Wouldn't mind commuting to work like that every day, actually. Hey, you have the number of the vet you took your dog to the other day? All right, think we're all done here now. He gathered his tools and stepped out of 2952. He then patted its side. Good boy. He could see its tail further down the dog train, wagging happily. We hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to click like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell. Have a favorite SCP you want to see on this channel? Leave us your suggestions in the comments down below. In the meantime, if you'd like to see more SCP content, then check out some of our other videos right here. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in our next video. Bye-bye.